Hello class, what I thought I would do is a lecture, an audio lecture for you on chapter 3 in our textbook, which is actually in chapter 5 in the original McGraw-Hill textbook that starts on page 67. The main subject of this ma uh, chapter is audit evidence and documentation. So first, before we get started talking about that, I just want to stress to you the overall importance of this chapter. As we're going to learn as we go throughout this course, auditors have to be able to obtain sufficient evidential matter to form the basis of the opinion. In Chapter 2, we learned that an audit is main function is to express an opinion on the financial statements. So what Chapter 3 slash 5 does for us is it gives us that evidence and documentation to be able to provide that opinion. First thing that I have, as you see on the screen here, is some discussion about audit risk. Audit risk is the risk that without knowing, auditors may fail to modify their opinion on financial statements that are materially misstated. In other words, they may issue an unqualified opinion when there should be a qualified opinion, an adverse opinion, or even possibly a disclaimer of opinion. We learned a little bit about that last week in Chapter 2, that you have the unqualified opinion that says the financial statements present fairly, but you also could have a qualified or an adverse or a disclaimer. An audit risk is that risk that we may not modify that unqualified opinion when there is some significant material misstatements in the financial statements. As you see here, I've got audit risk equals the risk of material misstatement times the detection risk. Now the risk of material misstatement is actually composed of two things. It's the inherent risk and the control risk. Now the inherent risk is a material misstatement occurring without related internal controls. What we mean there is an inherent risk is a risk that is naturally present with a particular account type. For instance, we all know cash is a highly liquid asset. Because cash is so liquid, it has a high inherent risk. So if you don't have strong internal controls to protect your cash, then you could have a material misstatement in regards to that balance. Um, control risk is material misstatement occurring without the controls in place. So control risk means if the controls that you put in place are not functioning as they should be, then you have a risk. So when you put the inherent risk in an asset times the control risk, that gives you the risk of material misstatement. Here again, some asset types have higher risks of material misstatement than otherwise and than other accounts. Along with the risk of material misstatement, we also run we also have detection risk. As you can see here below, detection risks now right here on the screen is when auditors conclude a material misstatement does not exist when it actually does. So the detection risk is that risk that we auditors run when there is a material misstatement, but our audit procedures, whether they be our analytical procedures or, or substantive audit procedures, fail to detect that material misstatement. So going back up here, you'll see if you take detection risk, multiply times control risk and inherent risk, those three components make up audit risk. And audit risk, one more time, is that we would fail to modify our opinion when a material misstatement had occurred. Alright, there's a higher inherent risk for complex transactions, difficult accounting situations, significant management judgments, infrequent transactions, and then valuations that can be impacted by the economy. Those run a higher inherent risk because here again, if going up to the page that I had here before, that's a material misstatement that's inherent without the related internal controls. So what we mean there is that these complex transactions, because they're harder to understand, there's more um, accounting that's more difficult, 
in those. They may be, there may be some transactions or valuations that have a lot of management's judgment in them. Those type things have the higher inherent risk. So those are the things that the, as an auditor we need to be tuned in to taking a look at and at least controlling for that. We have a lower inherent risk in routine transactions because not only is a company performing those typically on a regular basis, but also those that we can usually audit a sample of them and draw a conclusion from the sample based on the whole population. Ways to reduce the audit risk is to gather sufficient and relevant audit evidence. Not only has it has to be sufficient, so do we have to do a large enough test of sample sizes or it's got to be relevant. It's got to be um, something related to the assertions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Larger sample size will decrease our detection risk. Smaller sample sizes will increase the detection risk. There again, detection risk is the fact that there is a material misstatement and we fail to, protect, to detect it during our audit procedures. Now that we have discussed a little bit about audit risk, detection risk, inherent risk, and control risk, let's talk about relevant assertions. Okay? We remember from last week that we discussed that management is responsible for the fair presentation of the financial statements we said in accordance with GAAP. When they make these assertions, management is basically making some assertions that of each of their financial statement components. They're making assertions that their accounts, their classes of transactions that occurred during the period, and that their presentations and disclosures are, for pro are proper. In other words, that basically that they... So as I was saying on these assertions that are made by management in relation to the accounts, the transactions, and the disclosures, let me make a point up here. You'll notice I have the word relevant assertions. Those relevant assertions are those that, without considering the effect of controls, could have a reasonable possibility of containing a misstatement that could cause the financial statements to be materially misstated. So all assertions do not apply to all financial statement items. So what I've got listed down here for you is those relevant assertions that apply to each of these individual account uh, types of financial statements. Let's talk about assertions about accounts balances. All right, you'll see here the existence. What we're talking about here is that our assets, liabilities, and equity interests do exist. All right, we also are concerned with rights and obligations. That's that the entity holds or controls the rights to the assets and that the liabilities are their true obligations. Completeness, what I'm talking about right here, is that all accounts have been recorded valuation and allocation are those making sure that our assets, liabilities, and equity interests are all included at the appropriate amounts. When we talk about assertions that are relevant for transactions, these are classes of transactions or events that have occurred during the period. Occurrence is one of the main ones because we want to make sure that they have actually occurred and pertain to the period. Completeness, we want to make sure that all transactions have been recorded. Accuracy, they, we want to make sure they've been recorded appropriately. Cutoff, we want to make sure they have been recorded in the correct accounting period. And classification means we want to make sure that transactions have been recorded in the proper accounts. Okay, so let's go down here and talk about disclosures, which is the third type of financial statement assertion made by management. Here we want occurrence. We want to make sure those disclosed events have been, have occurred. We want to make sure the disclosed events pertain to the entity so they relate to those asset rights and those liability obligations. Completeness. 
We want to make sure that all disclosures that should have been provided have been provided. Accuracy and valuation, we want to make sure that it's disclosed at a fair amount. And classification and understandability, we want to make sure our disclosures are presented well and that they are clear. Audit evidence has to be both relevant and reliable. In order to be relevant and reliable, excuse me, we have to consider these assertions about that management is making about the account balances, the classes of transactions, and the assertions, and we have to obtain the audit evidence to support that these disclosures, these transactions, these account balances are fairly representative. When I say not only relevant, I also am reliable. If you'll notice here, I said one way to get reliable information is to get it from independent outside sources. However, we can also get reliable audit evidence from generated internal documents as long as we have a good internal control structure in place. If the auditor obtains direct knowledge, that's a strong evidence of reliability. And also if we can find evidence backed by original documentation. So when we're conducting an audit, first we have to do some risk assessment procedures. That should be the very first thing, and that'll be the first thing you'll do in your audit project. Uh, second, once we've done some risk assessment procedures, then we'll do some further audit procedures. That's where we look at the tests of controls, making sure our controls are operating effectively, and our substantive procedures, making sure our analytical procedures in our test of details of account balances. Now where you see up here where I talk about the audit procedures, NTE, that's the nature, timing, and extent. Those further audit procedures will depend on the risk assessment procedures that we did. So if we find cash, which we should, to be naturally predisposed to fraudulent transactions, then we would spend more time, we would put a higher risk with that type, account type, and thus we would do more extensive further audit procedures. Timing has to relate to when the events occur. We have to be very careful in timing that we put things in the proper period. And extent, the extent is to what level we're going to do them. When we talk about timing too, as you'll see here, I noted that performing procedures at year end is more effective than performing procedures during interim testing. The problem you run into if you perform procedures too early in the interim testing period is that situations and facts can change by the year end, which would make your audit procedures not as effective. So one way to have more reliable audit evidence is to do your audit procedures towards the end. Be cautious. I've got a note here of a related party transactions. Those are with related parties, can be blood relations, can be legal relations, uh, parent and sub, those type of related party transactions because they are more predisposed to having um, unfavorable outcomes for, for the particular company. The last part I want to talk about in this chapter is talk about our actual audit procedures. So besides our analytical procedures, that's where we do our ratio analysis, our vertical analysis, our horizontal analysis, other audit procedures are discussed in your book. Some examples would be inspection of documents and assets. That's where we go out and actually do inventory counts. We may count cash. We look at actual documents that are generated to record sales transactions, purchases, things like that. That's a big part of the audit time is spent on the inspection of documents and assets. Inquiry. We ask questions. We not only inquire of management and personnel, we do inquiry sometimes of outside sources. External confirmation. We will discuss that as we go out through, through the semester, but a lot of external confirmation is done in particularly when we talk about our accounts receivable and some of our uh, loan balances where we actually confirm those balances with outsiders. We observe processes and procedures performed 
That's why auditors sometimes are called trained observers because we do spend time doing that. We recalculate to check the mathematical accuracy. We may run some transactions of the client through our software just to make sure the calculations and extensions are correct. And then re-performance of procedures where we may actually use their software in the test of our transactions, a test bank is what we call it, and we actually run the audit. Same procedures the company does on them. Now audit documentation is very, very important. It's required for our auditing standards, and more importantly than even that, it provides support for the opinion. So whether you're going to issue an unqualified, qualified, adverse disclaimer, you have to have the documentation in your audit work papers to prove that. They also assist the team members in the planning and the carrying out of the audit. They're necessary for the review process, whether it be peer review, supervisory review within the firm, or whether we're talking about the PCA or BE reviews. All significant audit findings must be included in the working papers. And besides the current year working papers, where we'll put our audit documentation, permanent working papers will contain items of ongoing interest for current and future audits. So we'll have what we call our current file, which will document our, document our audit work. And then we'll also have a permanent file where we'll keep things that will impact future audits, such as maybe our articles of incorporation, our bylaws, our, our chart of accounts, you know, maybe some management policies and procedures that could impact our audit, things of that nature. So in conclusion, I just wanted to provide you a little discussion or lecture per se let me just say chapter 3 slash 5 is very important to the auditor. It determined, we talked about the risk, we talked about assertions, we talked about our audit procedures and our documentation. Thank you.